Hello, I'm Charles Edwards, and this is the History of Photography, Spring 2021. I want to go over the startup by going over the syllabus and telling you what you can expect in this class. I have a presentation which introduces the class as a PowerPoint, and I have our first lecture. Um, I would encourage all of you to Put the syllabus on your desktop or someplace you can actively um, access it. Of course, it is available through Canvas. The best way to contact me is email cwedwards at mountsac.edu. I'll check that every day. Class meetings are asynchronous. So every week there'll be a new lecture. Just watch it sometime during the week. Um, the only thing synchronous will be two office hours on Monday. They are 11 to noon and four to five. And um, if no one's showing, I'm not gonna show, but I'll be there at least for a while. I want you, if you have, if you have questions, that's a great time to talk to me in person. I will not record those. So your question is you know, not forever in the ethernet. Um, the textbook is A World History of Photography by Naomi Rosenblum, buy it used. This is history. A lot, most stuff hasn't changed, you know, in 30 years. And most of it's, you know, 150 years old. The history of photography actually only goes back less than 200 years. All of it is in the 200 year window. So that textbook really has it all. You don't need more than that. So this is a survey of history of photography from the early 1800s to the present introducing various concepts of photo representation and their impact on society. Field trip required, forget the field trip. This is the, this is the year of COVID or the second year of COVID. There is no field trip. You can completely let that go out of your head. Um, attendance and class requirements. There is no class, it's asynchronous. I would like all of you to watch, the, to watch these I need all of you to, and you all need to watch these. There'll be four papers and the content will really be covered and laid out in the lectures. I, per lecture, I'll tell you if a paper is being assigned and I'll also tell you when it's due. But you, know, you can actually you know, answer these or fill it, write these papers from what you've learned during these asynchronous lectures. There's a midterm, a final, and four papers. The breakdown from A to F is pretty straightforward concept. You wanna keep track of dates to remember. Start date, February 22nd, end date, 13th of June. Last date to add the class is March 5th. This class is actually full. So I'm actually gonna be doing ads. Last date to drop the class is also March 5th. Last day to drop without a W is March 7th. Last day to drop with a W is March 7th. Last day to change grading option, there is no date. Census date is the 8th of March. It is officially your job to drop a class you're not attending. Um, I'll do my best to keep track of people who haven't shown up. But since it's asynchronous, it's kind of a challenge for me to know if you're there or not. So I'd like you to, you know, step up. And if you're not in the class, drop it. I may send you emails and say, if I haven't seen your papers coming in, I'll probably send you an email and say, got to get that in. Or are you even there? I'll, I'll look in, I'll be following up on you. Now, here's my little confession. When I was in college, I took a class in Shakespeare what was I thinking? And it was incredibly difficult. You know, it was like holding a gun to my head to get through. In my defense, Shakespeare's not really meant to be read, it's meant to be performed. I got through it, I got a grade I'm very happy with, but I was sweating bullets the whole time. Next semester, uh, I was taking another English class and they were giving us all the little, we have to read this and this and this, and one of them was in a Shakespearean play and it was a skinny little thing. And I, I'm not gonna buy that. I have the complete Shakespeare from last semester. So when we got to that play, I started reading it 
and I was about two pages in and I realized I discovered in the border notes in my handwriting. I'd been here before. It was like the twilight zone. And I had no memory of reading this. I was so busy trying to survive the class, I left myself no room to enjoy the class. I would like you to enjoy this class. I would like you to be enriched by this class. I would like you to find this class, to, to see the fun parts of this class. And so I'd like you all to relax. If you do the midterm, the finals, and turn in each paper, you're all going to get a reasonable grade, a passing grade. Do your best, pay attention, enjoy the class, learn stuff, and don't sweat about it. If you don't turn in the papers, if you don't take the, the midterm and the final, and some people don't, you'll be graded accordingly. If you ace them, you're going to get a supreme grade. But if you do the work, you will be just fine. I want you to do the work. And these papers are not a big deal, They're like two pages, three pages, one page. They're not a big deal. I want to go through the rest of the way this is the syllabus and we'll get to them. We've gotten past the dates. Classroom and studio rules. There is no studio. Food and beverage. Well, I don't care what you do at home. When school starts in the year and we're hopefully we'll be back in school at some point, then you're going to see those rules come back. Plagiarism and cheating. Don't do it. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, there was a story about some school on the East Coast, one of those places covered in ivy, one of those really cool, expensive schools. And it was a class on organic chemistry. And there were these four guys who were the top students. They got all the best grades. They were like pre-med, you know, you get the picture. And come finals week, they all went to a party, got really drunk. And when they sobered up, they realized they'd missed the final to organic chemistry. They were sunk. They had flunked the class. And they panicked and they said, we're ruined. And one of them said, hey, we're his best students. He'll let us do a make it. We'll tell him, we'll tell him we had a flat tire and the spare was no good. So they went to him, told, put on the long faces, told their story. He says, no problem. You know, I'll give you, you can do a make it tomorrow. They studied all night. They showed up the next day. And he put each one in a separate room. He gave them their final exam. You know, question number one for five points, I don't know, some organic question. Turn the page for 95 points. Which tire was flat? They're all in separate rooms. Well, in the words of Mark Twain, we will close the curtains of mercy on this. If you're 20 years old right now, I was over 30 when you were born. I've got a big head start on you. If you need help, if you've fallen behind, if you don't understand something, that's what if that's what my office hours are for. You can talk to me and I'll, I'll talk to you and I'll, have, and I'll work with you. If you cheat, you can expect zero mercy from me. Don't cheat. Don't even think about that. Student learning outcomes. This is what's expected that you will learn in this class. Students will be able to recognize at least two major technological events that led to the invention of the first photographic process. Students will recognize the major inventors of the first photographic processes, Daguerre, Calotype, Loading. We'll get to those names. Students with that complete photo 15 will be able to define major photographic movements of the early 1800s and mid 1900s. Students that complete photo 15 will be able to discuss the social impact that photography had on the first decades of its introduction. Students that complete photo 15 will be able to analyze the various historical styles within early uh, photo art movements. Students that complete photo 15 will be able to contrast early art photography with and commercial photography. Students that complete 15 will be able to identify major inventors, including the inception of the photographic process, and be able to discuss and be able to describe the major early photographic processes. There's a little teeny tiny test that comes with the final exam. Is called the slow or student learning outcome. And I need, and you'll be taking that. You'll be fine, but you need to take it. Here's the thing. State of California pumps a lot of money into the community colleges, and they want to know that people are actually learning something. So they're going to see the results of that test. Um, years ago, I was applying for a job at PCC, 
and they gave us a printout of the packs of PCC. PCC cost 95 million, then it cost $95 million to run. Of that, only 15 million comes from tuition and lotto. The rest is all from the state of California, which is a bunch of money still. So California wants to know they're getting their money's worth out of these classes. There will be a slow test at the end of the semester. Be prepared. I will prepare, I will make sure that you're ready for it. Now, scrolling through the syllabus a little bit. Um, every week is listed by the month and day. The invention of, of the history and history of photography starts today. Early photographic processes will be in the following week. We will get into portraiture the week after that. We will continue portraiture the week after that. We will get into early art photography the week after that. We will get into a comparison of documentary and early art photography after that. After that, we'll get into technical improvements, Edward Moybridge and the photographing of motion. Uh, after that, we'll talk about the pictorialists and its followers. After that, the straight photographers and, and emerging styles. Now you can read this, you know what's going on. Small camera revolution and its influences. And that's when I assigned paper three to compare big and small cameras. Color photography, women in photography, documentary photography and photojournalism, photography after 1950, and then a final exam. Now at the bottom of this are your papers. Paper one, a three page report comparing early photographic processes addressing issues such as steps making I'm going to pull that over a bit. In, uh, issues as steps of making photographs and the quality of the image. We'll talk about that today, that and next week. So next week I will assign that paper. So pay attention to what I say today and pay attention to what I'm saying next week and you already just zoom that paper out. Paper two, a minimum two page paper comparing early and contemporary, support, contemporary portraiture. Early contemporary means portraiture here or now or in the 20th century. Early is the 19th century. Contemporary would be the 20th century. We're going to look at big portrait photographers from the 19th and the 20th century, and you'll be able to make a comparison of their styles and the look. Paper three, a minimum three page report to discuss the differences in working with small format and large format cameras and how the tool choice affects quality. I'm going to bring into this room a large format camera I own and little teeny tiny cameras, and we'll talk about them. Paper four, a minimum two page report evaluating a 20th century photographer of your choice. Oh, wow, choice is spelled wrong. I got to correct that. So pick a photography you like, and uh, we're going to look at a bunch of them in the course of this class. Pick a picture and talk about why that person's, you know, in your, appeals to you. So I'm going to put that away for now. And what I want to do now is I'm going to pull up handouts. We're going to talk about handouts. Now, you will see in Canvas, you're going to see in each module a handout listed as 001 notes or 002 notes. And that is a list of what I'm covering that day. Let me put this away. I can't even see myself there. So that's what I need to cover. So you can print it out and just write on it, or you can keep it on, on your desktop and make notes right into it. But it is from those notes that you will be able to draw on for your paper and your exams and your midterm. As you can see, I see camera obscura for today. Joseph Nip Nisfornyep. It's French, don't worry about it. That's how it's spelled. Louis Daguerre, William Henry Fox Talbot, Hippolyte Baird, Sir John Herschel, those were the, the biggies at the very dawn of photography that we're going to be talking about. 
So I'm going to start by talking a little bit of a camera obscure. A camera obscure means dark chamber. Um, that means any really dark box with a tiny hole. This is a pinhole camera. And there's a teeny tiny hole right here. On the back are inside of it is painted black. And those things will hold the film in place. I want to try something really fast here as an experiment. I'm going to put a light behind that pinhole in the hope that you can see it. I'm not sure if you can even see that. I apologize. Yeah, there's a little light popping up in that space. That's how small that hole is. Pinhole cameras can be made out of anything that is sealed to dark. Uh, if you're interested in making one, I encourage you to take photo 12. And that's one of the assignments is to make a pinhole camera. Or if you're interested, I'll, I can talk about it specifically later. It is. It has no lens glass for a lens. It has only a tiny, tiny hole. And we'll see a PowerPoint shortly. Light travels in straight lines. And since light has no mass, light can go through light. It's only energy. So light can go right through light. And through that tiny hole, light passes in straight lines and creates a picture upside down and backwards inside camera obscure. I would write that down and that's going to ask the question that's going to come back and visit you later during the midterm of the final. The picture inside a camera is upside down and backwards. I know when you look through your camera, it's not upside down and backwards. The camera you're dealing with has a five sided prism and a mirror that corrects everything for you. But in, in a raw camera, like, like a pinhole or a four by five or a cam or any camera obscura, the picture is upside down and backwards. Now, the earliest photo photographers were Joseph Nifor Niep. He was French. We're talking in 1816, he made his first. He tried making a photograph, but it came out a negative. And he thought he looked at it and said, well, it's a picture, but it's wrong. You know, everything was backwards. Black was white, white was black. He didn't understand. He didn't get then that ultimately that's how photography was run. He pursued it. And then in 1826 or 27, we're not sure which, he took a, a, a plate of pewter and, and painted on it bitumen Judea. When you're saying, what's that? It's asphalt. You may have noticed when they put down fresh asphalt on the road, it's messy and it can stain your clothes in black. But after a few days in the sun, it just bakes Big's heart. Well, that's what Bitterman Judea did on his plate when he photographed with it. It dried hard in the sun. It was an eight hour exposure to make the first photograph. And then he used uh, an oil to massage up the parts that hadn't dried and he had a photograph. This photograph was lost for like more than a hundred years and then turned up in somebody's attic. And today it's behind in a vault, like in, like in a helium container to protect it the very first photograph. Louis Daguerre. Niep had no connections. He was a smart man, but he, he didn't have a lot of connections. Louis Daguerre would be almost, I could almost describe him as the Spielberg of his day. Uh, Daguerre had worked in theater. He had painted backdrops, designed theater sets. And then uh, when this was all going down, Daguerre made a quite a lucrative living setting up these huge tents in Paris, these pavilions. He would paint uh, murals on the pyramids, life in Africa, Asia, the Americas, and people would pay money. Well, this is, you know, 1820s, 1820s. You know, they didn't have Netflix. Um, they didn't have movie theaters. They didn't have a lot of which they didn't have, you know, recorded music or radio or CDs or anything. There was some maybe a live band in the park. In terms of things to do, there wasn't that much. But this proved to be quite interesting. And he, they say 
that he could stage, you know, he could darken it and stage thunder, and it was quite dramatic. Ultimately, the pavilion was burned down, but it was a big hit in its day. And uh, Niep approached Daguerre and said, I have this way of making photographs, let's do it together. And Daguerre was, okay, they worked on it. In 1833, uh, Niep passed away, natural causes. His nephew or son tried to step in, but that didn't last long. Daguerre pursued it on his own and came up with a system by the late 1830s, which he named after himself a daguerreotype. A daguerreotype is a sheet of iron plated in silver and polished until it's a mirror, literally a mirror surface. It is coated in uh, silver salt, which are light sensitive, exposed in a camera, and then developed with mercury fumes. So the phrase mercury fumes should be putting the little red flags of alarm in your head. Really poisonous, really dangerous. A lot of the early daguerreotypists did not live to an old age. They didn't yet understand the danger of mercury. Um, in 1839, Daguerre wanted to announce his invention. So he went to a man named Francois Arago. And Francois Arago made a presentation at a an event in Paris, he announced the existence and he showed examples and it was a hit, it was a big hit. And the French celebrated, they invented, they had, a Frenchman had invented the camera. People for years had tried to come up with the camera, come up with a way of recording events from the past. This was a huge deal. William Henry Fox Talbot, English, um, rather wealthy, very well educated, um, something of, there's an idea of the English gentleman as something of a Renaissance man. He can make music, write poetry. He was a very successful man. He was on his honeymoon in the 1830s. He tried to draw and he realized he cannot draw at all. And the story goes, it drove him kind of crazy because a real Renaissance man can also draw. So he was pursuing an idea. He was a bit of a chemist as well, using again silver salts, which we knew would go dark. This was discovered uh, centuries earlier in the days of the alchemists. Alchemists were the predecessors to the chemists. Alchemists were trying to find a way of making gold. It was believed if you mix these just right, you can make gold and you'd be rich. For those of you studying the economy, once gold becomes really common, it's no longer valuable. But they believed they could make gold and if they had pursued it. And it was their work and their notes that tur ultimately turned into early chemistry. One of the discoveries at the time was that silver salts in a jar, when the sun, setting sun hits the jar, the side facing the sun goes dark, the silver precipitates out on that surface. Now, the dawn of photography is sort of like those old car, those old commercials you would see for Reese's peanut butter cups. A guy's running down a hallway with a bunch of chocolate. Another guy's running down an adjacent hallway with a bunch of peanut butter that plow into each other. And a third person goes, hmm. Well, photography is sort of like that. Camera obscure existed for some time, and the knowledge that silver salts go dark in the light was known for a while. And then it finally it was combined into a camera. Well, William Henry Fox Talbot's approach was different than Daguerre's daguerreotype. Talbot took paper and painted silver salts on it, put in a camera, made an exposure, and ended up with a negative. He would then wash it. And one of the challenges was that it would, in light, it would fade. This is where the last name on your list from John Herschel comes in. And we see hyposulfite of soda or sodium thiosulfate. That is, what we, for those of you who have got some darkroom experience, that's what we call fixer. And it dissolves the remaining silver out of the picture. So it cannot develop any further. Well, both the daguerreotype and Talbot's calotype, remember the word calotype, that was his process, required fixer, otherwise they would continue to develop. They would be washed and then used fixer and then washed again 
sort of destabilize them. And Talbot would take his negative and sandwich it with a, another piece of print paper, put it in the sun and expose it. Then he would separate them. He would then develop in gallic acid the positive and he'd have a positive print. The advantage of the calotype is once you have a negative, you can make many of them. The disadvantage was they weren't really sharp, sharp. The daguerreotype was incredibly crisp and sharp and beautiful. Let me show you a daguerreotype right here, right now. I have a black card here because as you can see, it's really mirrored. But uh, this is a daguerreotype. And this is the actual silver that was in the camera like 150 years ago when this picture was taken. It's not like it was made from a negative. It was hand, it was you know, right to the subjects. This is another one. This is Herbert Gates, 1860. And we'll be talking about portraiture in a couple of weeks, so we'll talk about these pretty cases. But that's, you know, if I tilt it away from this black card, there's a black card off to my left. You see a mirror surface, and you, you can almost see a negative of it. But against the black card, you can see Herbert Gates. And again, this is the original. And here's yet another daguerreotype. Daguerreotypes can be found, they're not really, but they can be found if you look around junk shops or get online and look for them. So as an example, I would show you a calotype, but I don't have one. They fade. They really don't have they don't have a lot of shelf life the way the daguerreotype lasts like forever. Now, so the calotype was a paper negative to make a paper print. The daguerreotype, one of a kind, think of Polaroid, the way a Polaroid is one of a kind, but it's a silver, it's a silver surface. It's what we would say in photography, archival. It lasts a long time. And the calotex not really archival. It will go bad with time. Now, the next name we list is Hippolyte Baird. Hippolyte Baird, it is believed he, he is also a legitimate inventor of photography, but got none of the fame. Here's the sad story. He invented, he was coming up with a camera and was had cultivated a picture. And he went to Francois Arago, who is already advancing the cause of Daguerre. And Baird said, look what I've got. And, and Arago wanted Daguerre to be the, the big success and the big name inventor. So he said, he kind of liked him, said, keep working. I think you're almost there. And, and kind of pushed back the time frame. Hippolyte Baird did not get the fame, but he is considered a legitimate inventor of photography. We'll see a picture of him. He staged himself as a drowned man. We'll talk about it later. So John Herschel, English. And Sir John Herschel was one of those guys who was intensely smart. He was an astronomer, a chemist, mathematician, many, many things. Never actually a photographer, although he did many, many things associated with photography. Fixer, the cyanotype we'll look at in two weeks. Um, he came up with words like positive and negative in photography. He did many, many things associated with photography. Sorry, allergies. Now I'm gonna put this away for a minute. And I want to pull out, that's what I mean by the black card that I have here. I'm gonna pull out my introduction to history of photography. And we're going to look at, get you a sampling of what this class is going to be all about. Now, this is what I meant by a pinhole. You see in that wall, a small hole and the sun on the left with a face on it is projected. If it were a better rendition, you'd see it's projected upside down and backwards against the far wall. 
So this is kind of how pinholes were discovered. Thousands of years ago, there was an eclipse. You know, it's like when you're walking down the road and you see the trees, trees overhead, little blobs of light at your feet. Probably didn't realize this, but what you're really looking at is out of focus projections of the sun upside down and backwards. Well, this was taken during an eclipse and all the little blob, the little dapple light against the wall were little uh, projections of the eclipse upside down and backwards. This is camera obscure. Remember that means dark chamber. And painters like Da Vinci would have these portable rooms that he'd hire some people to put on their shoulders and put down wherever he wanted, hang paper on the inside. And in the dark, he'd step in there, close the door so it's plenty dark, because this pinhole is small. And you need to let your eyes adjust to the dark to start seeing this stuff. So the picture of the outside is projected upside down and backwards on the paper. And you can stand there and pencil and sketch in the, the, the outside details. And when you've got it all, flip the paper over and you had a really accurate picture of the outside. And you could then paint it on top of it. This is the very first photograph done by uh, Joseph Niep. Yes, that's how you pronounce it, Niep. And this was pewter with vitamin Judea on it. It took us, this is an eight hour exposure. That's why the shadows are nowhere because in eight hours, the sun keeps moving and the shadows keep moving. This is part of his residence called Lecoq Abbey. And this is the first photograph. Now this is a, a blow up of a daguerreotype. You wouldn't want to do this. When you, if you have a daguerreotype, don't do this because the silver of the daguerreotype will corrode easily. Daguerreotypes, the ones I was showing you, are sealed in so that oxygen can't get at it and tarnish the silver. So these have never been opened ever in 150 years. Otherwise, the silver would have gone bad. That is Louis Daguerre himself, 1848. Now, he was only like a photographer for about 10 years, and then he just went on to other things. This is one of his photographs, earliest photographs. And this photograph speaks to how long an exposure had to be. How many people do you see in this picture? Probably two at the corner, a guy getting his shoes shined. The truth is there are dozens and dozens of people and horse-drawn carriages in the whole bit, but they're all moving. And unless they stand still, you can't record their presence. So they're all moving in this exposure that could easily have been 10 or 20 minutes, we don't know. This is Talbot's studio. So he, has, he made these large, had these large cameras and he would make paper negatives, which then these paper negatives would be sandwiched with a, a piece of sensitized paper again, put in a print frame, laid out in the English sun for about 20 minutes and then developed in gallic acid or gallic acid, they call it. Now, this is sometimes called a heliograph. It's, it's really like a photogram where you simply have light sensitive paper and you lay a, a plant or whatever you want right onto it and a, a cast shadow. The, the nature of print paper at all is it's white until light hits it and where the light hits it, it goes dark. If light didn't hit it, it stayed light. So the cast shadow of, the, of that, of that uh, stem of a plant keeps the paper underneath from being exposed. This is Hippolyte Bear. And he took this picture of himself as a drowned man. And then he wrote this sad story on the back of this paper about how this man was robbed of the fame of being the inventor of photography. He did go on to have a very good career in photography and be president of the Parisian Photographic Society. Now we'll be looking at these in a couple weeks. This is a stereoscopic picture. They made cameras with two lenses that were about two and a half inches apart and they take two pictures simultaneously, but these pictures are at the spread, roughly the spread of your eyes. 
and then you'd pop this double picture into a stereo and these pictures are off just a little bit so once you pop into a stereoscopic viewer it really looks three it genuinely looks 3d it's actually quite impressive these became really popular i'll talk about i don't want to give away everything i'm going to talk about in a couple of weeks portraiture you know before before photography came along a portrait was something that had to be painted by hand there were people who made careers doing little tiny mini portraits you know about the size of a silver dollar or a kennedy hat and people had no record of how they looked and along came photography and you could actually do photography interestingly enough has a very is a very accurate picture it's not interesting enough but it, re re it records details that may miss the eye of the of the painter of the artist now this is a photograph of queen victoria in the middle and at the very top there's the late prince albert and the entire royal family and in england this was a big hit you know the english loved their royalty or at least they used to and queen victoria was a big deal everybody in england wanted a copy of this may i guess that made mr john mayle quite wealthy matthew brady portrait photographer out of new york city his part of his claim to fame was photographing abraham lincoln the year is 1863 you know that's the year lincoln was assassinated. Matthew Brady, we'll get to him in two weeks when we get to 19th century portraiture. This is a photograph by uh, done by Robert Hallett. Now, we're going to get to this in documentary. This is the shipbuilder who built the Great Eastern, which was probably the public works project of his day, a massive iron ship. And those are the links for the for the anchor. They're huge. They probably I don't even know they have clues what they weigh per link, but they're incredibly massive. This is a portrait of a family, port photographer unknown. Fathers on the left, subservient wife, daughters are on the right. This picture speaks, tells us of family structure in its day. So photography is also is a window, not just to how people dress, but how people carry themselves and how the family was arranged. This is done by Carl Ferdinand Stelzer in 1845. This is a daguerreotype, and that one was known as the vegetable lady. This is done in the studio. We're gonna, when we get to studio photography in two weeks, I'm gonna show you pictures of 19th century studios with a lot of glass overhead. They were top floor skylights they needed a tunnel light to pull these things off and they would have painted backdrops you could just pull in the backdrop of your choice for the background now let's look at this one for a minute they're both holding a picture and there's like it looks like four kids are in the picture now he's holding the picture tenderly and looking off into the distance She's holding it harder. Her left hand is a fist, and she doesn't look happy at all. We don't know here, but I'm going to speculate that, I'll tell you right off the bat, that in, for centuries, people would have six, eight, 10, 12 children because in the realization, not necessarily all of them will survive to adulthood. You know, people died 100 years ago, 150 years ago. People died of things you wouldn't even think about today. Let's say we have vaccines and antibiotics. There's anti-vaxxers, but I'll be honest with you, vaccines have saved many, many, many lives. And antibiotics have saved millions of lives. So it looks like death came to town and they lost all their children. And that all they have is a picture to show for it. Now... Uh, as I've already said, it's quite common for people to, and when a child dies in the 19th century, to take the child right to a photo studio and get a last photograph because the child will be buried in a day. And you won't, and all you'll have is a photograph. This was, this went on until 1890 when the laws were passed against it for fear of disease being passed around in, in uh, photo studios. Travel photography. Now, 
for centuries, people kind of lived, people didn't travel far or more than, they were, it's not uncommon for people to have not have traveled more than 15 miles from the place they were born. Real travelers were a, a, a fairly unusual thing. Now, in the earliest photography, you had what was called a wet plate. You had to mix the chemistry on the spot, apply it to glass or to paper, and wet. Make your exposure immediately and go right back into the dark room. So travel photographers would take a tent, which was pitch black on the inside, bring all their chemistry. One thing missing from this is they very often brought paddock pack horses to carry all this stuff. Generally, you had to be no more than, than uh, three minutes from darkroom to camera. And so you have three minutes there, take your picture, go three minutes back and develop it on the spot. Once the ether dried, you were out of luck. You lost your chance. So the camera was fair. You'd set up the camera and you knew it was going to, but you were already pre-computed or planned your exposure and your framing and your focus. Mix the plate. You see the boy behind me, a photographer holding a plate, holding a holding a film holder, which will go right into the camera. The only thing that's wrong about this, in my view, is that the man has it has the dark cloth over his head and is still figuring out his picture when he should be taking it like right now. John Hiller's travel photographer photographed of the Pueblos of New Mexico. Timothy O'Sullivan was a Civil War photographer. When the war was over, he went west. He worked for Matthew Brady and photographed. I believe he traveled with Colonel... the explorer of the Grand Canyon. Maxime Ducamp, 1850, photo photographed in Egypt. If you look closely on the far right, you'll see a man there, which gives you a sense of perspective of how big that thing is. He also photographed the Sphinx and the pyramids. I've been to the pyramids. They are, re they are really big. And those blocks are like five feet tall. So it's not like a staircase. Samuel Bourne uh, photographed in India. Now, a little last couple of last comments about travel photography. These people brought these pictures back for, the, for everyone to see. And it really changed the way people saw the world because people really had a pretty much of a blank understanding of the world beyond their neighborhood. War photography. Roger Fenton was a one of the most famous English photographers of his day. He was, and he was, and I, I'm going to give you a little briefing on this, but I'll go into more detail when we get to war photography. Sent by England to photograph the Crimean War. You've heard of Crimea because it recently came back in the news in the last few years. Russia took it back from, I think, Ukraine. That's a messy story. But he was there to photograph the Crimean War. And this is, the, uh, I think this, this, this photograph is called the Valley, is it the Valley of Death. There's a scandal on this photograph. Did he stage this photograph? We'll talk about that in, in a few weeks. Felice Bieto went to the China Rebellion of 1860. Film is slow. You can't photograph battle in action. You can only photograph aftermath like this. John Rickey, this is photographed uh, the recovering of bodies at Gettysburg. Timothy O'Sullivan was, as I said earlier, one of the Civil War photographers. This is Gettysburg. Photographer unknown, all of these Union soldiers died in battle. Pearl Harbor. Lee Miller was a fashion model turned photographer. And later she became a war photographer. She was there at the liberation of the death camps as, as at the conclusion of World War II. Joe Rosenthal, uh, also a, was an army photographer. He was at Iwo Jima at the raising of the flag. You've seen this photograph many, many, many times. 
This is Tet, the Tet Offensive 1968 in Saigon. On the left is a South Vietnamese general. On the, on the right is a North Vietnamese soldier caught. And that general said, this is how we deal with these people. He raised his pistol and shot the guy right in the head with Eddie Adams and, and, uh, and uh, film journalists right there rolling their film. That film was run in the United States in a day. And they say, we lost the war in Vietnam. We lost the American support of the war in Vietnam that night. Because this is, this is called extrajudicial um, execution, which is a war crime. Larry Burroughs at Hanover Hill. This, this, this is actually originally a color photograph. Larry Burroughs, they say, is the only person who actually photographed blood. Narrative and art photography. Henry Peach Robinson is the creator of, of the composite photograph. This is actually done from five negatives. And he took some heat over this photograph. People said, how could you photograph a dying child? You know, what were you thinking? And, and the kid was like alive, fine, and 14. She appeared in the top of the room and said, hey, I'm okay. Uh, Julia Margaret Cameron was an incredibly noteworthy 19th century art photographer. She was a personal friend of Sir John Hirsch. We've already mentioned him today. Fred Hollanday was a pictorialist, liked to stage himself as Jesus on the cross. We'll get to him in a few weeks. Anne Brigman a early 20th century art photographer. Oscar Reichland. And now we're looking at what would be ultimately the dawn of Photoshop. This is, a, this is actually 30 negatives combined, very neatly. I'll talk about that in about three weeks. All the nude women are the same woman. Baron de Meyer was a fashion photographer in the early 20th century. Um, didn't change with the times. His style went out of fashion and that was, and his career with it on the vine. Lewis Carroll, we'll be talking about in about three weeks. You'll recognize that name from Alice in Wonderland. This is Alice Grace Well, a neighborhood, a kid in the neighborhood as Little Red Riding Hood and Lewis Carroll was a narrative photographer, photojournalism and documentary. This is George N. Bernard, 1853, the burning a factory caught on fire. This is the dawn of journalism, the destruction of the Hindenburg. Uh, the Hindenburg was filled with hydrogen not helium. America had the corner rocket on helium. It wasn't sharing it with Nazi Germany. So this thing flew the Atlantic, came to New Jersey where it parked. No one knows what caused it to burn. This thing was huge. This thing was like nine feet shorter than the Titanic and it burned end to end in 90 seconds. That is an interesting YouTube. Now, In the 1950s, there was a medication called thalidomide. It was not legal in the United States. A lot of countries did not authorize it. England did. And it was given to women who were pregnant and stressed out and needed a, a sedative. And when their children were born, their arms were and legs were often incredibly small. As you can see, this is a, it was known as the thalidomide generation. And this child was a victim of thalidomide. The Berlin Wall. Um, as World War II came to an end, Russia and the uh, Western Allies divided Germany, divided Berlin in a very strange way. I'll talk about that at, at a later point. This is a single soldier and the story goes, he was, you know, guarding the wall and an American G pulled up and the guy goes, hey, bud, go for it. And the guy jumped the wall and escaped to the West. And the next day, all the soldiers were, were guarding in pairs. And not long after that, they built a wall, a cement wall. You've all heard the expression, drink the Kool-Aid. 
This is Jonestown, Guyana, South America. This is a mass suicide of about 500 people who thought that their little paradise was gonna be brought to the end by the American government. And they all drank, they made a big vat of Kool-Aid, poisoned it and drank it. And the whole community died. The assassination of Robert Kennedy, 1968 in Los Angeles. The uh, bus boy holding with him is believed to be a undocumented alien. The only person who stopped to help Robert Kennedy was an undocumented alien. Think about that. Actually, I can find out who that photographer is. So I apologize, it says I'm no photographer. Might be Jacob Reese. This guy's spine is gonna curse him in a few years. Jacob Reese uh, documented, was a, we'll get to documentary photography, we'll look at Jacob Reese. And, and he was a, first a police photographer and later he photographed the poor of New Jersey and New York City and the squalor they lived in. Lewis Hines went all up and down the East Coast of the United States photographing children working in factories. This is, these are children who are working in incredibly dangerous conditions, who really should be in school working 12, 14, 16 hour days. And if they lose a limb or they're killed by the machines that are not protected, OSHA would freak if they saw this. And Lewis Hines, you can chalk up child labor laws to the photography of Lewis Hines. John Thompson was a travel photographer, came back to England and photographed the poor on the streets of London. Alfred Stieglitz was a pictorialist, founder of Photo Secession. We'll talk about him in a few weeks. This is a picture taken during his honeymoon and he saw all the first class people on the upper level and all the impoverished steerage people on the lower level with a, with a solid white ramps keeping them apart. This is one of his famous photographs. Dorothea Lang was hired by the United States um, by what was called the Farm Security Administration run by Roy Stryker to photograph around California. This is an iconic photograph of poverty during the depression. I'm certain that most or all of you at some point in your life have seen this photograph. Um, Eugene, w. Eugene Smith was a World War II photographer and then he was a time life photographer and he was sent on assignment to Minamata, Japan where a factory was dumping mercury waste into the bay where the community fished and ate the fish they caught. This is a woman bathing her 17 year old daughter who was blind and disabled in multiple ways from mercury poisoning. In 1979, student militants took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran, and burned the American. We saw the American flag get burned day after day after day. 1957, segregation ends in Arkansas. And so the black girl in the foreground is the first person to end, the first woman of, Af of African-American descent to go to this high school. And for a year, she had to put up with that kind of look behind her four feet. There's a woman just, you know, taunting her. And she put up with that in her ear for a year. She was incredibly brave. 20th century masters. Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams, master photographer, master printer. This picture was taken very close to um, what's that a Japanese internment camp? If you look to the left, there's the internment camp. I was there with some friends trying to find this spot. It's a boulder hill. It's impossible to spot. Imogene Cunningham, Ansel Adams and Imogene Cunningham were a part of a group called Group 64, photographers who met and talked about the field and mastery of photography. Imogene Cunningham would photograph flowers, dancers for children. 
She lived to a ripe old age. I'll talk about her in a few weeks. Edward Weston, also a member of Group 64, got a Guggenheim and, and put, took the money from his Guggenheim award and drove around America photographing and photographing. Paul Strand approached Stieglitz when Stieglitz had his uh, studio in New York City. And Stieglitz encouraged Strand to be a photographer. This was taken in 1916. Paul Strand is actually more of a precisionist photographer. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Man Ray, Emmanuel Radinsky. This was in this photograph, which he calls a rayogram, was an accident when his assistant accidentally turned on the light in the dark room when he was developing a piece of film, developing, developing print papers. He named it after himself. He called it a rayogram. Today we call it solarization. Edward Steichen was the most successful commercial photographer of his day. One of his photographs, which you can find the original, commanded $2 million. Ouija was a photojournalist. And he would drive around all night listening to a police radio he had in his car. He had loaded cameras and film in the trunk of his car. And he would hear of a crime scene and he could be there in a minute or two and photograph it. The police would zoom there and find that Ouija was already photographing. Ouija would look at it and say, I'm done here, it's all yours. Today, the police would be livid that they had contaminated the crime scene. They called him Ouija because he just knew where things were going. They called him Ouija as in Ouija board. Edward Moybridge is going to be a lecture in, in about three or four weeks. And this is the story of how he was one of, he won a bet for Leyland Stanford and to a certain degree invented the movies. Jacques Henri Lartic was a well was a French kid. His parents had money and they gave him a camera at an early age. <laughs> and he has actually made pretty much a photographic record of what it means to be like a, a 10 year old boy in France. Harold Edgerton was an MIT professor and he developed the electronic flash and we can chalk up to him high-speed photography. Philip Halsman was a time-life photographer who used a flash. He liked to, at the end of a photo shoot, ask his subject to jump in the air and photograph them airborne. Boylan and Smith were a couple of scientists at Bell Labs, New Jersey in 1969. And apparently over a cup of coffee, in one hour, they thought of the pixel. How to make a pixel, devise a pixel, an electronic way of recording light. 40 years almost to the day, they get the Nobel Prize of Physics for the pixel. This is an early, early digital camera. Yep, that's a cassette on the right, which is where you record the image. Chips. This one goes in the back of a 35 millimeter camera. And so it all begins. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And I want to get to proto photography, which is another PowerPoint that's going to go into a little more detail. Share screen. Share screen. See how this loads up. Cool. So some of this you've already seen. Now, I don't know if you've seen this. It is believed that in the deserts of Arabia, in the time we call the Middle Ages or the medieval days, they would punch a hole in one side of the tent and they could see anything and, and make a pinhole out of it. And they could see if trouble came over the over the sand dunes, they could see it in advance at the same time staying in the cool of the tent. This you've seen, this you've seen. So this is again camera obscura. 
And I will, I want to reinforce again, the picture on the inside is upside down and backwards. Then the desire to make really photo real images to, to paint photo real images. In this case, you would put your eye to that piece. It would make you stay in one spot and you were drawing your image. This is a contraption. He looked down and he sees her face as a double image right on the paper he's drawing. So all he has to do is outline it. This is another system. He reaches in his hand under the dark cloth and he can see the image. And he can, uh, there's a diagram above shows what his hand's doing on the inside of that dark space. This is called a camera lucida, or simply known as a lucy. You lay tracing paper on top of the glass and, and the image goes through the lens and is reproduced on the glass. I know when I was in art school, there was a camera lucy over there in the illustration department. <clears throat> Same kind of contraption. Now this, before they were using, before they had cameras and lenses, they would simply paint light sensitive materials onto paper and put plants on top. And this is like algae, for example. And it was uh, called a heliogram. This is an early photograph by Daguerre. Daguerre was an artist, so he knew how to compose this thing. Now there's a thing called retinal retention. Um, as that thing spins, it looks like it's actually like a horse in motion. They would use these tricks in, in, in uh, theater as well. So this is another heliograph. Buildings held their pose well and lend themselves to long exposures. They were also great Photography would record lots of detail that the artist might overlook. This is a lattice window done with camera obscure 1835. Another heliograph. I can figure what that is. You saw this in the previous one, long exposure, Louis Daguerre, only two people and two visible people in the building. Let's look at some of these portraits. This will tell you how rough early, early photography was. All the chemical stains and problems there were in the emotion. Adolf Braun, we'll talk about in a few weeks. Later in his career, would photograph antiquities in the Louvre and bring those photographs to America. Nep and Daguerre. First photograph, we've already talked about that. Eight hours. Daguerre an exploded view of a daguerreotype. Hippolyte Baird staging his death. This is an eyepiece for hand drawing. Now, this is a illustration in the newspaper because the daguerreotype became so intensely popular, everybody wanted to be have a daguerreotype made of them. I don't know why I'm showing that again. Portrait photography. This is half of that stereoscopic photograph we looked at earlier. A man and his collection of butterflies. Portrait of a woman. Again, we can see how incredibly rough the emotion was and how delicate the emotion was. The, phot the photographing of people who are deceased. Look at what he's holding in his hand. That's a lens cap. That was the shutter mechanism in those days. You'd pull the lens cap off, you'd look at your watch and time it for three minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, put the lens cap back on, that was your shutter. A lot of these early portraits were done in an oval part of the presentation, mother and child. You know, a record of how people dressed 
in the bodice they wore. And consider his body language and how a man presents himself. You'd always have the hands in some place doing something so they wouldn't move. Also, the use of a mirror to show a second angle of the same face. Well, this is a seriously damaged image. Woman with deceased child, you saw that in the previous one. John Brown. This was done by Southworth and Hawes. Terrible lighting on his face. Wow. There was no um, artificial light then. Everything was done by a window or outdoors. Probably a mining town. Americans love the daguerreotype. You see how s smooth the water is because it's moving and a longer exposure was required to take this picture. People traveled and brought back pictures of antiquity. The vegetable lady, we've seen her already. There's a thing called colonialism in photography where you ask an indigenous American to hold his weapon and look fierce imbuing with him our you know european view of other cultures you know a glass pavilion ton of light we already saw this is the um, dawn of photo of photojournalism a burning factory view of the moon it's only a matter of time before pornography would become step up I apologize, but there's some repeats there. I want to just dodge. So, we talked about the daguerreotype, the calotype. The calotype was made by William Henry Fox Talbot, the daguerreotype by Louis Daguerre. You know, think about that for your, your next next week. I will in your, our next meeting. I'm going to talk about some other early processes. And your first paper is pick any two, and compare the quality and the procedure. Is it convenient? Do you have high quality advantages and disadvantages? And that's what we're getting into with this class. Um, thank you. And I will see you next time. You'll see me. I don't know if I'm ever going to see you. You'll see me next time.